Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, making the choice to spend your lunch hanging out with me as I, I go over um, environmental justice tools. Uh, yeah. We're going to keep it um, pretty broad, but there will also be uh, a Maryland centric focus, especially within the context of the Climate Solutions Now Act. My name is Ryan Kometz. I am the Director of Sustainability at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, and a, as promised, we will have a, a special guest join us. Um, originally, Jackie Patterson, she's the, uh, was originally supposed to be here um, at the beginning, but she had a last minute schedule change. So she'll be here towards the end. Uh, but Jackie is, is the former uh, EJ person at the NAACP and the current founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project. And I'll let her explain more about what that means when uh, she's able to join us. Um, my colleague, Claire, is going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A uh, for any questions. And at the end of this presentation, it'll be available to everybody to download, stream, share, uh, whatever your preference is. So, uh, without further ado, um, you know, what is environmental justice? Uh, this is the EPA's definition, but essentially what it boils down to is a fair and meaningful treatment uh, and involvement of all people of all walks of life. Uh, it goes beyond just trying to protect the land, and it really looks at humanity's connection to and uh, protection uh, for Earth's ecology. It wants to understand the systems and the feedback between us, the built environment, uh, and the natural environment, and regardless of race, uh, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual identi identity, and really it's how do we protect folks um, and understand how folks are exposed to harmful exposures of toxins and pollutions. Um, so there are a great example would be uh, the folks in Flint, Michigan, who were exposed to the lead piping and unfortunately still are. Or then if we look more Baltimore centric, uh, there are lots of examples of potential environmental justice or injustice issues within Baltimore City. Uh, you have the wheel abrader, the trash incinerator wheel abrader plant as an example. Um, an emerging thing that is kind of all over the nation are the uh, PFOS, the poly, um, can't remember what it is now, but the PFOS, chemicals, polyfluorinated uh, alkali substances, I believe, um, which were in fire retardants utilized to fight fires primarily for military aircraft. Um, but really it's understanding what pollutants are affecting which communities and what disparities might be serving as a de facto barrier to these communities, either addressing the pollution problem, addressing their exposures, um, remediating an old site or mitigating a, a currently active site uh, and making sure that everybody has access to the same tools, um, the same processes, the same uh, technical experts or subject matter experts. So you'll notice that I also put in this term environmental justice intelligence. Uh, so an emerging thing in the field, uh, in well, really in data science and geospatial science is this idea of an environmental intelligence. Um, and that's understanding all the various data sources, all the various data modeling, and also including uh, local or indigenous knowledge as well. And how can you overlay the different data? How can you understand the statistical features of the different data uh, and utilize both human reasoning and uh, an emerging thing is, is machine learning, whether it's supervised or unsupervised, but to uh, basically understand all these different interactions and all the potential exposures based on one's place, both in space and time. Uh, so really the tools we're going over are very uh, rudimentary environmental justice intelligence tools, because what we're doing is we're essentially looking at demographics 
and where the demographics fall within census tracts and what the various exposures are at those census tracts for, for folks. Um, so that's that's kind of enough of, of the background. I, I really want to get into it more so that we can better understand how we can apply these uh, within our daily planning. Well, not daily planning, but overall planning for large projects um, and also making sure that we're thinking about this stuff when we're having these conversations. So what I tried to do is break down some examples for everybody. Um, so when I put this together, the primary tools were the EPA's EJ screen, the, the Maryland EJ screen, and I, I'll get into what the differences are. And then the White House's um, CEJST tool, which was just released a few months ago. Um, this week, Maryland Department of the Environment, they uh, advertise that they have their own MDE EJ screen, uh, which is essentially the Maryland EJ screen um, with a few other factors that are specific to the DP um, involved. Uh, I just didn't have the time to be able to include it since they only announced it this week. Um, secondary uh, that we'll talk a little bit about, but not a whole lot, are EPA's Enviro Atlas. So if you're not familiar with that, uh, it's a website maintained by the US EPA. It's updated every week and it lets you go in and you can put in your address or a facility name and it'll actually show you all the facilities uh, within a certain radius or area that have some sort of reporting mechanism to the EPA. Uh, it could be stormwater. It could be that they produce uh, hazardous waste. Uh, it, it could be that it's a brownfield. Uh, it runs, or they're part of uh, Tosca. It runs the gamut, but it allows you to quickly understand what type of potentially environmental polluting activities uh, may be occurring in an area. Just because a facility is on there, doesn't mean that they're doing anything poorly. It just means that they're on record with the EPA uh, and they have to submit regulatory reports as per the EPA's guidance. Another secondary tool is TRI or toxic release inventory. For a lot of folks, this is going to be the most uh, interesting data as it tracks the pollutants that are released uh, typically during an industrial usage and what's going into the air. Uh, or water or land, and it ta uh, will look at um, all the hazardous air pollutants, a lot of the uh, VOCs or volatile organic compounds, also heavy metals. And basically what it does is it requires a facility to report uh, how many units, it's typically pounds, but obviously if it's something that it's really small, it might be in grams or micrograms, but how many uh, units of weight of X substances are they releasing uh, during a year and where are they being released? Are they going up through the stack into the air? Are they going out uh, the pipe into a wastewater treatment facility? Um, or uh, there are sometimes a great example, a lot of people don't think about this, but if say you're a arms manufacturer and you test fire rounds, bullets have, have lead in them. And if you're doing that on an outdoor shooting range, where does that lead go? Unfortunately, it remains in the environment. A uh, little bit's gonna go to the air, but a lot's gonna go to the soil. And then when you have storm water, you'll have lead runoff and it winds up in your waterways. Uh, the EPA has a risk screening environmental factors tool. Um, it's known as RSEI, uh, uh, it's also indicators. Uh, that tool also allows you to kind of understand from a demographic point of view uh, what people are facing and how close they are to certain facilities. It actually it essentially takes the TRI information and combines it with demographics. And then you have FEMA's National Risk Index, which is more of a climate resilience and natural hazards type tool. Uh, but what's interesting is they do combine some aspects of environmental justice. So they'll bring in uh, demographics, uh, which includes uh, the age of the community members, the median income, the poverty level, all the things that you think of from like a, a sociology population demographics class. 
And it'll actually model that based on a census tracts overall risk for natural hazards. And that will help you in long term planning to understand, say, for instance, you're down in Houston. Uh, if you model for an extreme hurricane, like they've had in the past, you can understand potentially which neighborhoods or census tracts are the most vulnerable because they have the least amount of economic uh, activity. They have old, a very old population or a very young population. And this can help emergency managers or even NGOs figure out, okay, we know that, that this community, they're extremely vulnerable. How are we gonna help them prepare for the hurricane? What can we do extra to help them? As opposed to potentially another community where they have a very good, a very healthy economic activity. They have people that are highly mobile um, and able to evacuate themselves. And then what, I'll, what I've called NGO supporting, um, ProPublica came out with the tox map last November, December, and it's kind of a cool mix of TRI uh, and the EPA's risk screening tools. Um, and they do it a little bit differently. They adjust some of the assumptions and some of the data, and it looks at uh, highly populated areas in, in the United States. But the point that I just want to drive home, um, there are many different tools out there. Some are really good at X, Y, and Z, while others are really good at A, B, and C. But for the, the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus on, on these three over here. So before we dive into it, I really want to emphasize what these tools are not. They're not replacements for actually engaging the community members. These are simply screening tools to understand the overall data, the overall makeup of, of your community. You still need to solicit public input. You need to value local knowledge and you need to talk to your neighbors. Um, it's not a replacement for collaborating with these communities. Uh, just because you go out and say you have one public hearing with with a community, that doesn't equal collaboration. That Those take work. Um, and also, there are opportunities for really cool and unique partnerships that uh, between, I'm in higher ed, I assume most panelists are, but between um, higher educational institutes and our community neighborhoods. So these tools don't replace the, those things. They supplement them, but they're not replacements. Um, and these tools are absolutely not substitutions for inclusion planning. Uh, some grants now are requiring an inclusion plan to go with the overall grant narrative. And just saying, well, I ran EJ screen it is not an inclusion plan. It's part of it. It's a step, it's part of the chapter. It's a step towards it, but it won't suffice for the whole thing. And uh, nor is it a substitution for an equity impact assessment. And that's understanding what your projects or projects are going to do to the surrounding communities to make sure that everybody is uh, being heard, valued and represented, and that no one specific community, demographic entity is being adversely impacted more so than anybody else. Um, as we get into it too, I always, uh, since this is environmental intelligence and geospatial, I always like to give people a very brief overview of precision versus accuracy. Uh, so these tools are very accurate. Uh, you can look at a county, I'll use a county versus a census tract to help folks understand. So uh, looking at the demographics or the EJ screen at the county level is very accurate. You, you know, you're, you're like, okay, I, I know I'm getting an A. Um, I'm understanding the overall makeup of the county. For those of you familiar with the Baltimore County area, you know Baltimore County is pretty big. Uh, so what may hold true in the south part of Baltimore County, demographic-wise, that may not work for the middle of it. It may not work for the northern part of it. Whereas precision is basically how close everything is uh, to other values. So that would be like a census track. Um, so census tracts are much smaller in scale than a county. Uh, or think of a city block versus a neighborhood. So really it's just 
understanding per precision and accuracy. And you wanna make sure that you're using the best data available for your situation and that it's not always a one size fits all. So I just like, sometimes people are visual, sometimes people are, are they like numbers, sometimes they like words, but essentially it boils down to when we're looking at these tools, you know, what pollutants are in the air? What does ozone look like? What are cars and trucks contributing? Uh, is there lead paint? Are there hazardous wastes? It, what kind of petroleum uh, products might have been around or are around? What's going into the water? How does it affect people? How does it affect health and where we live? So the other thing to talk about is the EJ index versus the EJ score. So an EJ index um, is basically what you see on the first part of the cartoon here. And it's essentially just a way to try to normalize the data, whereas a score is taking a little bit um, away from it because then you don't have the population of the, of the census block group. Uh, it can get a, a little confusing. And the reason why I bring it up is because the EPA's tool uh, utilizes the EJ score whereas the, um, or the EJ index, excuse me, whereas the Maryland EJ, EJ1 does use a score. So EJ screen, uh, and in this case, this is true for both the federal EPA one and the Maryland uh, state one, it's target on, it's really anybody. Uh, and it's used to identify and compare communities to others across the nation. One important thing to remember though is Climate change really doesn't fall into EJ screen. Um, it's really looking at your, your current conditions, uh, your current pollutants that you're exposed to, not necessarily uh, climate justice, which is very similar to environmental justice, but uh, can be a little bit different. Um, but climate change would be understanding, like back to that example of Houston, you wanna include kind of what are the hazards that these communities may face. Whereas the uh, CEGES um, tool, it was actually mostly developed for federal agencies. Uh, and that's to ensure that they are working to understand communities with conditions of underinvestment. Typically these communities are going, uh, they're going to be people of color or indigenous uh, Americans. However, what's interesting is that tool actually does not consider race at all in its metrics. Uh, and there are, are a lot of, I won't get into whether that's right or wrong. Um, there are a lot of scholars that, that are, and there's a lot of debate going on right now. Um, but what's really important is neither of the tools really solve the situation. They don't address cumulative impacts um, overall, whether they're good, bad, or, or indifferent um, from all the various stressors in the environment that impact everybody's health and well being and the quality of life. So, here's a screenshot from the EPA's tool. Um, it, this is showing you uh, part of Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Um, it highlights geographic areas for further review. It does have a national data set uh, that is consistent with methods. So we're looking at Baltimore here and the methodology that's used here is the same as if we were to go out to San Francisco and look at communities within San Francisco. It has 12 environmental uh, in, and 12 environmental and seven demographic indicators and it winds up in an EJ index. Um, once again, this is the EPA's EJ screen. Uh, it, its goal is to make everything apples to apples across the country. Uh, so, back to that accuracy and precision, it's very accurate uh, when you look at it from a, a country level um, and, and county level. However, when we think about going into the Maryland EJ screen, now we've upped our game and now we're getting more precise because we're looking specifically at uh, things for Maryland. We're not normalizing the demographics across the entire United States population we're focusing specifically on the state of Maryland. Um, it does drill down to your census tract levels. And what's interesting is it 
incorporates several other data sources and data features that are absent from the federal tool. So it looks at uh, folks with asthma, emergency discharges, and watershed failures. And that ends in an actual score. And as you can see here, this just explains, once again, it's a little graphic explaining how they get, get to that score. Um, and then we look at the climate and economic justice screening tool. Uh, once again, this is one that boils down or drills down, excuse me, to the different census tracts. Uh, and it considers, it uses an if then algorithm, algorithm. So if the census tract is above whatever that threshold that it's looking at, uh, and we'll go over that in a minute for one or more of these indicators, and it's above a threshold for socioeconomic indicators. Um, so it, there's that if then is, is kind of missing from EJ screen. Uh, the if then is more unique to this tool. So it's really saying we're only going to consider it uh, an area of interest if it meets all these criteria. Whereas EJ screen is specifically, it, it doesn't care. It's saying here's the data, here's where it ranks. So which tool should you use? Well, unfortunately, there's not really an easy answer. Um, it depends. What does it depend on? Well, for us in Maryland, it's going to depend on whatever the legislation requires for, for the state entities. Um, it also, you might wanna supplement it with something else, um, with a different tool. It, it depends on what you're interested in, in learning, what you're interested in planning for, um, and also what the different and various needs are of the community. So all of the tools include everything that you see on, on this screen here, um, which is really good to understand. So PM25, that's gonna be your air quality, so is ozone. Um, diesel particulate matter exposure, that's important not only for communities along the highway, but also communities that are within proximity to a port. And the reason why is a lot of those port ships, they're idling while they're waiting to have their, their uh, cargo on or offloaded. And not all the diesels equal, depending on where they filled up in the world. So some of them might actually be burning diesel that has higher sulfur content than if they filled up here in Baltimore. It also looks at your traffic proximity and volume. And that's important also because if you live next to the highway and the highway is always all the time backed up and cars are idling, you're exposed to a lot more of those tailpipe emissions. You're also exposed more, potentially exposed more to the various uh, heavy metals that come off tires and brake pads. Whereas if you live at the end of a dead end street in the middle of any town USA in a rural area, you're not exposed to that stuff nearly as much. The overall poverty level um, versus low income, linguistic isolation, that's looking at how many uh, people can actually communicate. Uh, it doesn't mean just communicate in English. It just means are there sources and available ways for folks to talk to one another and understand one another. Unemployment, high school, um, Lead paint, uh, that all these are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, how close you are to a hazardous waste facility. I mean, just because there's one in your backyard doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. Um, but if they have a spill, what are you going to be exposed to? What are the potential there? Um, national priority list sites. Once again, these are, are facilities that they have the potential um, to have a lot of nasty chemicals and the potential for you to be exposed to them if you're close to them. Same thing with risk management facilities. And then finally, wastewater discharge. Uh, but really, once again, all of the tools do look at these factors. Uh, where it gets kind of interesting is the climate um, tool from the White House from their 40 Council. They're also factoring in stuff like higher education, agriculture, uh, building loss, population loss, energy. Um, so it is interesting because this tool is trying to get beyond, um, a little bit beyond just 
what the data is and also really bring in the demographics to help target more vulnerable communities, if that makes sense. Uh, I really, I encourage everybody to go play with these and try these, these tools out to understand what I mean. I, I find that usually the best way to understand how something to work uh, works well is to play with it um, and to really explore the data for yourself. Uh, but I wanted to make sure everybody had a good overview of what these can and can't do, really. Um, EJ screen only. It looks at your air toxics cancer risk, uh, the respiratory hazard. Um, here, you'll see under five, over 64. Those are usually your very vulnerable uh, populations. And then people of color, which for this instance is just percent of folks non-white. Um, these are only factors that are considered in EPA's EJ screen tool and none of the other tools. Uh, for Maryland's EJ screen only, uh, I had mentioned this before, but you have asthma emergency room discharges. So how many people went to the ER complaining of asthma? So that's tied directly into air quality. Um, heart attacks, myocardial infraction discharges. Once again, we're, there's correlation between exposure to pollution and uh, poor air quality and also heat and heat exhaustion uh, with heart attacks. So it does consider that low birth weight infants. Um, that is usually, I mean, there are many things that can influence that, but there's a strong correlation between the mother being exposed while she's pregnant to a myriad of chemicals or pollutants. Um, and as, if you start to kind of think in circles and systems here, you can see why that might be important. Once again, if you're living uh, in the city and you're next to the highway, you have all those cars that you're getting those tailpipe emissions. If you're, say you're in Baltimore City living by the highway and by several industrial smokestacks, you're getting those emissions. And say you also have lead paint in your home and, and maybe that's getting in the mother's inhaling it or somehow ingesting it. All these factors can come together and can cause uh, low weight infants. And then watershed failure, that's looking at, um, because we're so close to the bay and so tied to the bay, really understanding uh, how our watershed systems are functioning and the impacts that we're having on them. And with that, I see Jackie is, is in here. I am um, very happy and honored and pleased to allow Jackie to talk about her experience with environmental justice and why this uh, information is so important. Um, so Jackie's the founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project. And I believe she is ready to talk. If I, yes, I hear her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. So just go, go for it. <laughs> Was there any more framing that you wanted to, to share or just, just that? Um, <laughs> It's all you, Jackie. Okay. And how long did you want to, to chat a little chat? Um, ten, you have 10 to 15 minutes okay. or, or we can open it up to questions also. Whatever yes. you're the most comfortable with. Yes, no, questions would be awesome. So I'll just say a couple of things and then maybe we can just go interactive it would be fantastic. Um, yeah, so. So it's really an honor to be here with you all. Uh, Ryan has been such a blessing to our work since the very second that we met him. Um, as you, as just from um, being an ear and eye on what what he's presented here, it's just a a fraction of all that he has brought to the Chisholm Legacy Project because this data and mapping is so absolutely critical given the scale. And the depth of the of the of the challenge and the opportunities and possibilities. I'm sitting in my car outside of uh, the office of this group called Blacks in Green in on the south side of Chicago, where I was born and raised. And I am speaking at an event. I just got off of a panel speaking on energy equity. And we were talking about this very situation. I was, as I said, I was born and raised here in Chicago, where 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 I was, I was within ten miles of coal fired three coal fired power plants, 
And at the time, and I also lived right off of the Dan Ryan, which is one of the most busy um, highways in the in the nation and most traffic highways in the nation. But you know, growing up innocently with you know hopscotch and popsicles and block club parties, you don't necessarily know why it is that half the folks in their church are you know on a respirator machine, half the kids in your classroom are carrying around you know little asthma inhalers. Why? my own parents you know both uh, passed over the last a uh, couple of year uh, last few years of 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 cancers that you know you don't know where 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 whether the cancer clusters that arise from being in these kind of what they call a toxic donut of all the you know and i mentioned the landfills also in an area that is disproportionately that is largely african american and and uh, and a lot of low income um, um, households and communities, and also a, a large Latino population here as well, and again just surrounded by by toxic industries and, and facilities, and so that you know the data that that Ryan was just showing, the 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 fact that this that Chicago and the circumstances here are not unique to what we have around the nation. And then on top of the fact that, you know, that we have these, that coal-fired power plants, the landfills, the the uh, near roadway air pollution from the highways and so forth, as well as a railroad that takes, you know, everything from liquefied natural gas to coal to all, you know, to just goods and transporting and are, um, are emitting all kinds of um, toxins into our communities. And so these are the realities of so many folks, and this is just the urban areas. And then we also know that there's, that there's similar situations in rural areas as well. And the thing that's that's too often in common is is race. Uh, Dr. Robert Bullard talks about, has done studies where he showed that on an African-American family making $50,000 a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making $10,000 a year. And whether it's African-American communities, Latino communities, indigenous or, or Native American communities, this is what we have in common is being more likely exposed to, to, to toxins, um, toxic practices and toxins. And so, and so these are the, and then we have the other side we work on climate justice, as you see from the slide. And so then for us, the climate justice is the continuum from the drivers of climate justice, which is uh, fossil fuel based energy, but all, all other other um, other greenhouse gas emissions to the impacts of climate change. And again, uh, a place like Chicago is known as an urban heat island. Um, we, as, as part of this event, they are, they did a film screening of a film called Cooked, which I recommend to you. And it talked about the the uh, heat wave that Chicago had that that killed, I think, over eight hundred people. Um, and when I when I hear when I'm here and I look around and I see the the dearth of trees here. The the canopy the tree canopy is 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 large largely lacking and and when I watched that film cooked and did a couple of talks on it I was struck as I saw the images and cooked in the neighborhoods and I thought that's where my grandmother lived and where I know that and I noticed even when I was a child that there were no trees in her in her neighborhood and and that that became a for people are on in terms of not having that protection from the heat that's increasing from climate change. We all know the stories of Hurricane Katrina. We all know the stories of Superstorm Sandy. Um, and we all we all know the story that's unfolding right now, just south of where I am in, in Kentucky, with 16 people and counting as the death toll from the flooding that's happening in in um in Kentucky. And so that's all the the bad side and there's also there's also the opportunities for 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 turning this around um there is a i was on a panel with a person named stephen benjamin who is the mayor of columbia south carolina and he talked about how covid um was the he said that covid served as an x-ray 
to expose the broken bones of American society. And those same broken bones are the are the the pathways of vulnerability that that climate change, that environmental injustice follow those broken bones of just systemic inequities that put certain communities in, in harm's way, but then also puts us all in harm's way in certain communities more than others. And the fact that there is with the racial awakening with COVID-19, with unfortunately the, the increase in disasters, with the economic crisis, the people are becoming, coming to the realization that we do have a fundamentally flawed economic system and that increasingly people are starting to really be open to the question of the extent to which we could actually tweak a system that is doing exactly what it was designed to do to concentrate wealth and power in the hands of a few and to have a system where just by design there are winners and losers and we also are starting to see where people are seeing are getting to understand that the replacement theory that drives so much of the challenges out here people have this scarcity scarcity of 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 resources when in in fact the method driven by those very same people that are trying to hold on to wealth and power. So people are beginning to to have a understanding working and how it's not working. And so that gives me hope that we can actually come together and start to make some changes. We saw how in with COVID-19 when it, unfortunately, there's a quote from Winston Churchill that says that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing once they run out of all other choices. <laughs> and so that's, that is a, that is a sad, sad fact that we've seen too, too many times. And the starkness of, of the, the crises that we're seeing now are kind of, um, are kind of forcing people to think, to think like, uh, you know, okay, this, this really isn't working and we don't really, these, these, these paths that we've tried before aren't really leading to where, where we need to be. And so we are starting to see the rise of communities that are growing their own food, the rise of communities that are generating their own energy and de de developing microgrids. We're starting to see the rise of local manufacturing and the, and the, pro the, uh, that folks are looking to Etsy instead of Amazon and seeing that like we can start to make our own things and support ourselves um, as frontline communities. And so the start, the, 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 the rise of those things are few and mighty and they can become the norm as we begin to tell that story. And as we begin to, to, to really advance it and alter it to the narratives and the, when we know that one of there's a, if I show, when I um, do presentations, I often, include this um, image of this thing called the Coke to push, push and it has like the uh, image of, um, of the Coke brothers, uh, this billionaire brothers, one of them has passed away, but, and, um, and it shows the tentacles of their influence and in, including the media. And, um, and when we think about the, the narratives around job killing regulations, the narratives around, um, around how the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time and therefore wind and solar aren't, aren't options and narratives around super predators as, as black men as super predators, all of these narratives are the things that are driving this kind of fear, fear-based action versus recognizing, as I said, the abundance and the possibilities. We don't, we don't have to have, we, we don't, we can have both health and jobs. So regulations aren't, are, 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 are actually life preserving, health, health preserving regulations. And we can actually have jobs that um, in in the new energy economy, in the in a regenerative economy for all, and so we saw how in in um in hurricane in, um, in COVID nineteen how there was that political space to talk about universal basic income. There was that political space to talk about a jobs guarantee. There was that political space to recognize that we can actually re you know re engineer our society to to to. Uh, to live in abundance and to live in a way that it recognizes that we we are interdependent and that there is enough to go around and that the replacement theory is a myth and that 
and that there and that even as it relates to immigration policy and again that's another myth that people have that they're coming to take our jobs when really they're just coming to survive when we as four percent of the global population are responsible for 25 percent of the global emissions that drive climate change that are forcing people away from where they live because there is no longer livable but we and it's not like they're coming to take something from us that we that we don't we can't afford to give there's land there's opportunity and abundance here. And there's also a responsibility that we have to provide safe harbor for people who, who need it because of our actions. So that um, is what I would say in terms of just a, a, a bit of a grim assessment of, of, of the state of, of being, but also a dawning hope in terms of what can be and what is beginning to be that we can just uh, take to scale if we really uh, link arms and recognize our oneness, recognize our interdependence, and recognize the abundance to be to be reaped from an, a regenerative economy as opposed to a, an extractive economy. So I will stop there and uh, and hope we can go right into some kind of conversation. But I'll hand it back to Ryan to. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, really, everybody, this is a. Uh... An opportunity, um, the geeky stuff, you can ask me, uh, the actual <laughs> practical on, on the ground stuff. Uh, I'm so glad Jackie had some time for us. So please either put it in the chat uh, or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask any questions you may have. We do have one question in the chat already um, from Lydia, who says that she'd love to know more about the history of the Chisholm Legacy Project. Sure. Yeah. So briefly, um, I have spent before la July 1st of last year, I had spent the 11 years previously um, as the as the senior director of the environmental and climate justice program at the NAACP and. And in doing that work, we were. There was so much in the way of the needs in our community and the needs of the movement and in the needs of even kind of mainstream environmentalism, mainstream philanthropy and so forth, who were seeking to do better around grounding equity and justice in their work. So we as the as the environmental climate justice program, which was just one of six programs within the NAACP had grown in terms of visibility and had grown in terms of just the sheer level of demand for what we were doing. Um, it reached a point where I was getting 50 emails per hour and folks were reaching out via all these other avenues. So that was kind of one kind of breaking point for us in terms of just the container there as one of six programs was just too small compared to the volume of demand that we had. The other the other piece was um, in terms of the Chisholm Legacy Project was in our last few years of operating, Shirley Chisholm, who became a kind of an iconic uh, source of inspiration for us um, at the NACP, as you can imagine, folks are always trying to co-opt our name, co-opt our work, co-opt our communities, and um, whether it's fossil fuel companies trying to, to give money to communities to get them to to, um, to something on, or to silence them so that they don't protect, protest their dastardly deeds. And the NAACP was particularly targeted for that because we're seen as kind of this moral authority. Um, and and so that was happening often and for various, and so that in particular and her whole um, kind of, um, our, her slogan as part of her campaign work. And for folks who don't know Shirley Chisholm, she was the first um, African-American woman in Congress and the first African American and the first woman to run for the president of the United States. And her campaign slogan was unbought and unbossed. And that became our slogan and rally and cry as well. So she inspired us both in terms of that. She also inspired us in terms of her um, equal stance on racial justice and gender justice. 
so we can when you read her speeches when you read about her you just see her as much championing um women's rights at that time as as um as racial justice and particularly at a time when people were trying to encourage black women to say yeah you know you'll get that you know equal rights for women but you know really just trying to deal with race racism as enough so like let's put that aside for now and just focus on the racism thing but yet she said oh, no i'm going to really stand for both of these and so she was a, a real champion on a number of levels for us so in some ways our story started way before um many of us were born and in and, and, and shirley chisholm and her leadership so yeah um so that's that's kind of a little bit about the origins of the chisholm legacy project and now um, out of the demands that were overflowing when we were at the NAACP, the focus of the work is on Black liberation, on gender justice, particularly Black femme, on, um, and on uh, just transition and climate justice. And we have kind of four buckets of that work, which is community building, movement support, um, bending the mainstream arc towards equity and justice, and Black femme well-being. So, that's in a nutshell, <laughs> us in our work. We do that through research and policy, like I said, community organizing. We have a particular focus on, on clim climate finance. We also have a robust set of work around um, uh, narrative shift, narrative strategy. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I could say more, but that's in a nutshell. Um, everybody, we, we have approximately 10 minutes left. I, I do want to honor everybody's time, but we do have time for one other one or two other questions. If anyone has one, um, if not, we can kind of wrap up and uh, there was a request for the links in the chat. Uh, I will make sure that all the links are available to everybody as well. Um, kind of in the post production process, I can add a slide with all the links right there on 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 it for you all. But if there are any other questions, there is another one in the chat from a little ways back. Um, My bad. It's okay. From Liz, uh, Liz asked, "Are there any national environmental groups that have been particularly open to your work?" I think that's a huge yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, actually, um, a, a number of them, but so. I am actually here at this event. There's a, I was surprised to see walking in was the, the former director of environmental justice at the Sierra Club. And the Sierra Club, for all of its large national work, the environmental justice program has always been a, a shining light under the leadership of uh, Dr. Leslie Fields and um, her team of folks in different places. And so, We've really enjoyed working with them on that on that environmental justice programming specifically, as well as the labor um, work with the labor department within the Sierra Club. So that's been um, very gratifying in terms of national organizations. I just retweeted, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the appointment of Dr. Adrian Hollis to lead up environmental justice at the National Wildlife Federation prior to her coming on board with, and we're looking forward to that because she's actually on our advisory committee. We've enjoyed working with them prior to her with uh, Mustafa Ali, who was a former um, head uh, deputy director of environmental justice at the EPA. And he's been leading up environmental justice at the National Wildlife Federation. So we've collaborated with him in terms of kind of those, some of those big green groups. Um, Within the NRDC, there is Khalil Shahid, who does work on environmental justice. And so often it's kind of like there's the organization and their kind of mixed kind of history and, um, and, and present. And then there's kind of folks that they get on board who have like the ethos and the methodology and the, and the, the e yeah, the ethos, let's say, that, uh, that resonate with us. And so we'll, we'll work with them. Um, and not so much the institution as a whole. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then there's other organizations that are 
kind of more in the mid range, um, not so much the kind of the big greens as you think of with you know EDF and those, but some of the other groups that are kind of mid range groups that we work with include the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is where Adrian Hollis used to be, but um, but also there's other folks on the Union of Concerned Scientists staff with whom we work as well. So those are a couple of examples. Thank you for asking. I think it was Liz. Yeah. <laughs> Jackie, thank you so much for for taking some time out of your wicked busy life uh, to spend some time with us. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor. And um, Jackie, your email is available on the Chisholm Legacy Project's uh, website, right? I think so. Okay. Yes, but if but best way to reach if if anyone wanted to reach me would be to reach out to E A team E A T E A M at the Chisholm Legacy Project dot org because that's the executive assistance team, and whereas with them you'll definitely hear back with me there's like a one in five chance that you'll eventually hear back in your lifetime, <laughs> so um, that's a. That's the best way to go with EA team. And so they'll hear back. And if you want to talk, then they can put up a time for us to talk or whatever. But they're definitely the best one. Well, th best. thank you so much, Jackie. Sure. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you for the honor again. Feel free to, if you ever want to chat again, I'm here for it. I appreciate that. Uh, sure. Everybody, we just have, I think, two or three more, more quick slides. Um, this slide apparently doesn't want to work. Oh, there it is. So there, there is a QR code at the bottom and you're welcome to use it if you want or not. But uh, what I did was I put together a little matrix uh, for folks that goes over the three tools and will allow you to search based on what you're most interested in learning about the communities for which uh, you're working with. And then based on the one comment in the chat for URLs, I will add uh, a hyperlink at, at the top so that you can just quickly go to each tool uh, for everybody. Um, and with that, I'm, we kind of had questions already for Jackie, but if there are any questions for me, uh, you can ask me now, you can shoot me an email, but I, I really thank you all for spending uh, your lunchtime with me on a Friday. I, I hope you learned something and this was useful for you. Um, but I'll, I'll hang around, uh, but if not, have a happy weekend.